Okay, we're going to kick off and everyone who's joining us uh, will just sort of step in as and when they uh, join the call. <clears throat> so hi and welcome everyone. I'm Jo Fenn, I'm the Project Director for AdGreen. Uh, thanks for joining us today for this session, which is part of our annual review launch series. In this session, we're going to take you through the data and insights that are especially relevant for you guys as production company people, which I think most of you are. And then we'll hear from our brilliant panel who I'll introduce in a little bit. So we probably won't get to any live questions because we're a bit short on time, but the team will do their best to answer any questions you might have in the chat. And you can always reach out to the AdGreen team for support as well. And during the session, we'll pop some links in the chat, which will be referencing various things that we'll talk about. So keep an eye out for those as well. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank our industry partners, Get Set Hire and Traveller for their support, which enables us to run events like these for the industry. And we've got an agency event uh, and also a, uh, uh, brand event coming up as well. So if you've got any colleagues in those areas who that'd be relevant for, do feel free to um, let them know about those as well. You can find those on our website. So first of all, kicking off our slides, we wanted to share some highlights of the annual review, which we published a few weeks ago. But before we go into the specific data insights, let's talk about carbon context. So you've got a reference point as we go through. So for those who may be less familiar, Emissions are measured in grams, kilos and metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent or CO2e. And generally speaking, the more you do an activity, the more emissions will be generated. So here's an extract from the review where we list some activities and their carbon impact. This is from our favourite book, our team favourite book, uh, How Bad Are Bananas by Mike Berners-Lee. So one of the stats we give on that page is the average annual footprint for a person in the UK. Um, on the next slide coming up, you can see the average global footprint, uh, so per person globally on average. What do you think the UK averages in comparison? So seven globally, pop in the chat what you think the UK averages in comparison to that seven, which is globally. 12, good guess, 11.2, very specific guesses, I like it. <clears throat> okay, these are good guesses, I like them. Okay, let's reveal the actual amount, please. So it is 13 tonnes. So that includes what the average person consumes in terms of material purchases and food, how and how much they travel. <laughs> yes, well done, Jenny. Uh, how they power their home and how much energy they use. So keep that 13 tonnes in mind as I run you through the stats from our 2022 data, because that will help you sort of contextualise the numbers that we're talking about. So... Let's get started. So during 2022, various agencies and production companies completed 515 projects that resulted in motion or stills content. So that was essentially entering information about the various uh, activities that make up a shoot, like travel, power at the studio, catering and so on, plus the post. And then there were 17 audio projects too, most of which simply included an audio post session for a radio spot. So for the insights in the review, we just looked at the completed motion and stills project, so just the 515. <clears throat> so as you can see on this slide, 2,446.1 metric tonnes of CO2, e, CO2 equivalent were emitted as a result of the 515 projects that were completed in 2022. So 2,446.1 metric tonnes. 289 of our 515 projects were coming in at under a tonne, so a tonne or under, with a combined impact of all of them of 83 and a half tonnes, so nearly 84 tonnes. At the bottom end of that, or at the other end of the scale as it were, at the, the sort of lowest down circle, you can see there were four projects that were over 100 tonnes each, with a combined impact of 457 tonnes, sorry 459. So we've got at the, at the sort of lower end 289 projects that were under a ton and then four that were over 100 and you might think those four are sort of anomalies but actually they look very representational sort of hero content which we'll come on to in a minute and remember that we're comparing that to the average footprint of a uk citizen in a year of 13 tons so for those four projects that were over 100 that was the equivalent of the emissions generated by eight people in a year in the uk and that was to create you know, around 30 or 60 seconds worth of motion content. Those projects didn't necessarily create any more content. They were just bigger in terms of scale. So <clears throat> that's the overall impact of the projects completed last year and where they fall on the scale in terms of size. But what about average size overall? So in our full data set, 
the average size of a completed project was 4.7 tonnes. Although projects range massively, as you can see, from 1.5 kilograms to 129 tonnes, 129.6. The average budget was 156,000, which gives you hopefully a point of reference, being production company folks to give budgets all the time. And of course, that doesn't mean that everything below the average is good and everything above is bad and therefore, you know, fine. Uh, so the good ones are fine. It's merely a data point for reference. And you can also see that the median impact, uh, project impact was 708 kilos. So that kind of shows us that the data is skewed quite low. We know that there are many more projects akin to those in the 50 tonne and over buckets being produced across the industry, both in the UK and beyond, which are not yet being recorded. And for those who maybe can't remember from GCSE maths what the median is, it's the middle value when all of the numbers are ordered by size. The middle project, if we line them all up, all 515, was only 708 kilos, which just shows you that they were skewed towards the lower end. So that's across our whole data set, but what if we just look at the larger scale productions that many APA members are working on, for example? When we looked at projects with shoot days and a budget of over £50,000 per shoot day, the average jumps up from 4.7 to 12.8 tonnes and the median from 708 kilos to 2.6 tonnes. So if 50k per shoot day feels like the type of project that's normal for you, then the benchmark you'd want to reference is more around that 12.8 tonne mark. So moving on as to who is responsible for these projects. Um, in this graph, you can see um, the projects that were created by the organisation that created them. So when we talk about who creates them, it's the principal production partner or PPP, which is usually a creative agency who would then invite the production company to contribute their information. But sometimes it's a production company working directly with a brand. The PPP will also complete a project when all of the information has been finalised. Think of it like actualising a budget. So as you can see here, 87 companies were responsible for completing the 515 projects and just five organisations completed 200 projects between them. So we have a real uh, set of super users there. Those top five are really prolific users of the tool. 39 companies completed just one project, which you can see by the little tiny segments at the top. So we also looked at tape up, take up amongst top production companies as per televisual. So only 7% of projects, so 38 out of 515, were contributed to by production companies in Televisual's 2022 Top 30 listing. If we flip that around, 11 of the top 30 UK production companies contributed to projects, including five of the top 10 companies. So it's clear from the previous few slides that engagement is needed from agencies and production companies working on those larger scale productions so that we'll get a more even picture and that median comes up to where we kind of think it should be. So we'd love to see these organisations embedding the recording of footprints into their production processes, so collaborating with the agency, adding draft information about the planned shoot and finalising activities so that the agency can complete the project. However, we know this will take time and training and further refinement of the tool to make it easier and quicker. And of course, as we get more larger projects uh, recorded in the tool, the average project size will rise along with sort of everything else that's related to that. So let's talk activities. We often get asked uh, which things are the most the most bad, the worst, I should say, that's better English, isn't it? Uh, so across all the projects we had last year, travel and transport accounted for around about 63% of carbon emissions. Energy and fuels uh, used to power the different spaces involved in a production was almost 25%, so quite a big chunk next. Followed by materials at 12.4%. And finally, disposal was a tiny sliver at 0.6%, which is what we're expecting to see in terms of the order of these areas that really follows what Albert have known for the past few years. So what we expected was true. And here's a breakdown for the um, four largest projects recorded in the tool in exactly the same way. So the ones that were over 100 tonnes. In both cases, when we looked at projects with a budget of over um, sorry, in both cases, and when we looked at projects with a budget of over 50,000 per shoot day, travel and transport is consistently the highest. That will pretty much always be the thing to focus on first when it comes to measuring and reducing. And you can see that for the four projects over 100 tonnes, these ones on the right, three of which recorded air travel, it accounts for almost half of the overall emissions for the projects combined. So 49% of that pie is air travel. 
So the project without air travel recorded their fuel for road spend, uh, sorry, their fuel for road travel by spend, uh, which was around £30,000. That included crew, cast, art and costume departments, equipment, facility vehicles, scouts and tech scouts. And we know that air travel can have a big impact. We don't want to overshadow the fact that diesel and petrol fuel vehicles can have a huge impact too. And this example shows the impact that uh, per passenger per kilometer traveled is actually higher for one person traveling alone in their car than one person flying uh, from London to Edinburgh if they're traveling that distance in their car alone. So if you're bringing together a cast and crew from different places, delivering costume props or scouting out various locations by road, this can really add up, especially if everyone's traveling in their own vehicle. So could you look at alternative options? such as car or tech vehicle sharing or local crew and equipment sourcing. These are just some ideas that you can start to think about once you know what the, the sort of worst impact is. So this is where the tool can really help you. <clears throat> We'd really like to highlight the three stages of using the carbon calculator. The registration process is really simple. So once you're registered, you can do any of this yourself. First, you can use it to check the impact of one activity against another. For example, a flight versus a train or a car. Next up, and ideally this is done in collaboration with the agency, you can draft your part of the footprint using information from your budget, for example, a number of catering heads allowed for, or a spend on generator fuel. And then you finalize the details from your production to complete your part of the footprint and only completed projects go into our data set. So if you've got a few sitting around that you think, oh, we've nearly finished those, we could just kind of get the last bits in or we only have to press the finalize button, go for it. And then we get a few more projects in our 2023 data set that we can use to see where we're at. So in the annual review, we included a few suggested actions that production companies can take. We always group them into these sections, as we know from the previous few slides, that travel and transport should be considered first, as it usually has the highest impact, then spaces, then materials, and finally disposal. So you can see for travel, using local talent to reduce travel emissions, hiring electric vehicles when required, and for spaces, using low energy lighting and mains power over diesel can be good options for reduction too. For materials, select reusable materials over disposable ones and cut down uh, or cut out meat consumption and finally create a reuse and rehoming plan for any items that you use but we know that's going to have the smallest impact in terms of reduction because it has the smallest impact overall. For more tips like this you can now download a bespoke version of the resources guide which has been created for those at production companies and includes suggestions relevant to your role on a shoot and there's a link just go in the chat for that one. Now before we introduce our panel, a couple of final things. Last year, 25% of trainees were from production companies. The training is a great way to get started with what can feel like a pretty overwhelming topic. And we've just covered a lot of material at breakneck speed. So the training really gives you the time to kind of think that all through. The main module gives you a deep dive into the context and the tool. And from there, there are bite-sized modules coming soon, including how to use your budget to create a quick draft footprint, which I touched on a minute ago. We also have very short, uh, two minute <clears throat> how to videos for the carbon calculator, things like how to log in, how to add people to projects, how to enter an activity. And you'll find a link for the training coming up in the comments now as well. For a final bit of data, it seems fitting at this event to look at who attended our events last year. So we can see that 25% uh, of attendees were from production companies during 2022. So in addition to taking our training and using the tool, we'd love to have more of you attend our events. We'll be sharing, obviously you guys are here, but people that didn't necessarily turn up today. We'll be sharing a quick survey in the comments section now. And we'd love to have more of you attend our events. We'll be, sorry, sharing a quick, sorry, creating a sharing quick survey in the comments section. We'd love to know what you think about topics, timings, and formats that you'd love to see. There's only six questions on the survey, so please do take a minute to fill it in. We'd really appreciate it. And it will help us kind of shape future events. And finally, we really wanted to spotlight the production companies who uh, led the way in 2022. Uh, these are the top 12 from last year, and we'd like to thank them and everyone else who contributed to our data set in 2022. If you haven't yet downloaded the annual review, there's a lot more beyond the information that we've just gone through. So please do download it after the event. You'll find a link in the comments as well. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce our panel. If everyone can turn their cameras on, that'd be great. Um, welcome everybody. So I'm going to um, welcome everyone. So first of all, we have Steve Davies, Chief Exec at the APA. Then we've got Stitch, Richardson, MD and EP at Spindle. 
Tom Webb, MD at Park Village, and finally Dahlia Saeed, um, uh, PA, and Oliver Watts, or Ollie Watts, uh, runner at Biscuit Fieldworks. So thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Hope you're all doing well in your respective remote locations. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah. No yeah. worries. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Rather short notice, so we really appreciate you joining us. We know you're busy, busy in production. So first of all, Steve, I'd like to come to you. Why do you think it's important for the APA as a trade body to support the sort of sustainability efforts of the whole production community? Well, first of all, Joe, thanks to you and the team for your customary brilliant efforts to drive this forward. Uh, they're really uh, phenomenal. Uh, of course, it's that we all know the environment is critical. It is critical that we show leadership, um, and it's something that everyone should do. And it, as we say about diversity and inclusion as well, uh, not just should you do it, is it a responsibility, but at some point it will become a business imperative because people will only work with companies who can prove they're environmentally responsible. So you may as well get ahead of, ahead of the game. Um, and we know our members are responsible. We know our members are interested. What we have to do is just make it easy for them. Yeah. Uh, and of course, at the moment, their main concern is getting enough work because you can't yes. do anything without enough work. That has always got to come first because otherwise you aren't here to do the good things. So we have to fit these objectives in with that central business objective. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. Thanks, Steve. And Stitch, have you experienced, we know obviously as Steve's mentioned, this is, you know, this is something that's new for everyone and despite best intentions, it's not always the easiest thing to do when I know I'm a ex-production manager, I know what the process is like, I know the speed everyone's working at. Have you experienced any challenges when you've tried to introduce sustainable practices at Spindle? And also, on the flip side, what kind of successes? Yeah, I think there's, um, I think the number one challenge, and this has been the case for the last couple of years that we've been doing it really, is just how quickly and efficiently you can get the knowledge across to the production mm -hmm. team early on. Um, just sort of setting the expectations, yeah. making sure everyone's clear on what they could do and how could do it, how to do it as well. There's still sort of um, a slight lack of knowledge out there. I think in the in the freelance produce community, some of them are amazing and really on this stuff. But mm -hmm. but if you um, if you don't get that off the bounce, then it's a little bit tricky. And we've sort of um, tried a few things with that. We had some packs and we had some um, some kickoff calls for explaining why we were doing it, and really sort of so people understood the reasoning. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that we've sort of discovered over the last year is the, the thing that's made so much difference is actually having a green steward in house. The, the moment we did that, it sort of changed everything. So we yeah. we had them involved in making the pack, becoming our own sort of internal um, expert on ad green on the calculator, and then they're involved in the briefing at the beginning, um, the capturing of data, and also where possible they go out on our shoots. So you just have that consistency. But, but to answer your question directly, that the main thing that we struggled with was connecting what we wanted to do at Spindle with, you know, freelance productions. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing wasn't really, wasn't really sort of a, a challenge, but it's just sort of been development. It's been the, the trial and error of it. Sort of working out what makes the biggest impact, what we can control and what we can't control. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, a situation early on when we were doing it where we, where we found out that having beef on one of our sets gave us a bigger carbon footprint than the flights on mm -hmm. that project. So it's really sort of been, been working out what has the biggest impact and where we should put our attention yeah. um, and sort of <clears throat> learning the more and more we do. Yeah, no, there's some really good points there. I think having someone that really is the champion and really is that go-to person um, really is such a good idea, as long as obviously you can afford to do that and that's something that you can build into the way your business works. Um, and I think as well, sort of, you know, touching on that beef versus flight thing, that's exactly the sort of thing we're talking about when it comes to the tool. So we're about to release a couple of um, updates in the next few weeks where you'll actually be able to look at all of the activities you've recorded in one go and order them by impact. So that will give you a really good indication as to what things to chip away at first and what things are absolutely the bottom of the literal list, because it will be a list of activities. So, you know, those sorts of things hopefully will become sort of demystified with those tweaks as well. But that's really great to hear. So yeah, it's, it's really cool. I love it. Um, so I think we've lost Tom for a second. So I'll move straight on to Dahlia and Ollie. So you guys are super users. Um, we'd love to know, um, you know, really making measurement part of that production. We'd love to know how you've done it and how you've sort of introduced it into the process at Biscuit and what the response was like from other people in your team and kind of how you became the, the champions. Um, Should I go first? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think we kind of have a similar model to Spindle where we basically try to use as many in-house people as possible. 
So mm -hmm. what we'll do is also we try to have these conversations as early as, as early on as possible with a job. So we really do it from when we're bidding a job. So what we do is when we're um, bidding a job, we'll even have an addendum in our treatment that states that we are an ad green, that we are an ad green company, and that we abide with the ad green guidelines. So it's something that going in that they understand. Along within our budget, we have lines for carbon calculator PA. We have lines for carbon offset. We have lines for um, uh, um, uh, ad green steward so things like that it's already very much something that everyone kind of understands from the get go that this is something that will be factored into the production of the job um, and then on, on shoots we have our ad green steward who is typically an in-house person and um, they really just help us with just making sure that they were abiding, abiding by the guidelines um, we also even sometimes introduce the ad green steward to some of our crew that can impact it so we will introduce them to the location manager to, to talk about waste for the shoot um, we will sometimes have them also um, talk to different sort of HODs to figure out what they're going to do with their waste are we keeping costume are we going to be um, are we going to be able to donate it catering as well um, these things can kind of like we just try to have these conversations as early as possible and we find that each um, project that we do, the earlier that we can have those conversations, the better results that we get and the more data we can collect and Ollie can do that. Yeah. yeah, I think that, that that's one of, one of the biggest things for us is having someone who is in-house, who is there at the beginning, who then follows the job through, is on set, standing next to the bins, making sure everyone's recycling, going around, making sure that they have all the data they need, and then being there for the four, six weeks afterwards that it takes to, to put in all the information and then do any revisions so that these things can actually be completed. Because as you mentioned before, you know, it's, it's, it's great to start, but it's really important to finish. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's been burned into the way the company runs that every single biscuit job needs to have an ad green report at the end. Yeah. Just, That's great. And I think it's, yeah, it's so important to have that so early because it really just sets your intention with whoever you're working with you know, about what's expected, whether you've got freelance production people coming in or other heads of department that are coming in. So that's brilliant. I would just um, mention, I, I don't think, or I hope it didn't take you four to six weeks just to do the calculator. I think you're just talking about sort of as the job wraps <laughs> and you're gathering that final bit of information. <laughs> just to clarify for everyone who's now terrified. Um, yeah, so it's kind of basically as well, I guess, starting up front, then you can, um, you know, you can start that draft footprint early. You can put in what you know at that point and you can refine it as it comes in whether it's from you guys or whether like you, the person you've got on set who's sort of your eyes and ears. Um, but that's really great. That's brilliant to hear. Um, Tom, I'm going to come back to you in a second. Um, Steve, just kind of following on from that, what do you anticipate? We've heard about a couple of things that Biscuit have done there to sort of mitigate some of the hurdles that they think might, might be there. What do you think are going to be the biggest hurdles for the sort of, you know, to get sort of mass adoption amongst production companies? Obviously, we've got super users, but we've got a lot of companies that probably haven't yet dipped their toe in. So what do you think are the sort of biggest hurdles? Well, I think uh, their system at Biscuit sounds great because everyone understands where they are from the outset. I mean, I favour anything that makes it simpler, really, as we, we've discussed. And, you know, if we can get to a very um, close to accurate uh, answer without having to ring so many people up afterwards, I think we'll get more adopters. <coughs> but, um, you know, and, and I also appreciate that you want a, a comprehensive view of the carbon so there's a, there's a fine balance there but i know that's something yeah. that you are you are working on mm -hmm. yeah sort of not letting uh, perfection get in the way of progress right well Making i think sure so that, yeah you know, you're, you're getting so. started as opposed to sort yeah. of worrying about every finite you know minute detail sure. yeah 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 and it sounds great that you know the, those budget lines are in there for biscuit as well they're kind of upfront and right. noted and can be discussed with the different parties that are involved and you know there, there can be a, a rationale for why they're in there and you know what's going to happen as a result of that being contributed to by the agency or ultimately brand. So so yeah, that's brilliant. Um, Tom, jump back to you. I think you, you've now jumped back on, which is brilliant. Um, we, so we know that Park Village is really committed to following sort of good practices, and you, you're a net zero member, I believe, and sort of looking at that bigger piece as a whole. Um, it'd be great to sort of understand what you've done company wide to support a reduction in emissions, not just from production, but sort of I guess your whole operation. I think you've got a studio as well. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I guess to start, it's probably important to say um, it's our 50th anniversary this year. So I, in that, we feel a particular responsibility because of our heritage. Um, and we also, by having a sort of different office setup, um, 
you know, unlike, I guess, a lot of production companies where they might have a smaller office with, you know, a lower energy output and waste. Um, um, we have uh, the studio complex, which is 10,000 square feet. So that is does have the, the potential to have high energy usage and um, produce, you know, uh, more waste than, than your average production company. So with those two things combined, you know, we felt... Um, we really needed to look at our entire operation, you know, not just the productions where we go and do the shoots, but actually sort of everything from the ground up. And um, we began that process actually um, by consulting uh, a, a, with an eco audit specialist. Um, we were introduced actually to this company called Three Acorns. Um, the guy was absolutely amazing. Um, he actually um, had this incredible story where he was he was a ballet dancer and he had an injury and the injury was so bad that he ended up spending time living in the Amazon with a tribe for years and years. And he sort of really got to understand the sort of damage and destruction that was going on through sort of being part of that. He, he came into the office and he and he talked to our team and he really sort of hit a, a, a sort of nerve and, and, and everyone, you know, in the end sort of was pretty much wiping away tears and it sort of began this journey of um I think like he he laid out a set of goals for us and you know after that sort of passionate speech he gave and the goals that he'd set you know we were on a journey to sort of really do our best to kind of hit those goals or do better and you know when you know it reminded me of the you know the ad net um the ad green annual survey in terms of it's a framework for measurability and accountability and for us that sort of um setup is incredibly useful because it means everyone can you know have something to look at and share and discuss and update regularly and it helps with the mindset of ev everything in terms of how we mm -hmm. you know push that out to our freelancers and our clients and you know obviously we have this setup where we shoot our own films and productions and photo shoots and 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 we shoot them on location or abroad but we also have this setup where we have the studios and we hire that out to other production companies that can come in and use them for their own events um shoots photo shoots etc so sort of by by sort of doing that and and looking after our own set of um i guess well looking at what we can do it, it 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 sort of radiates outwards to everyone that comes into contact with us and that's our sort of aim is like fixing our house first um to allow others to hopefully you know look at what we're doing and maybe um you know get some inspiration and likewise we have people inside in that come into the building where you know we're inspired by something that they're doing or something that we haven't thought of um and in terms of measurability, you know, that that has led to, you know, we've looked um, recently, we, we've we're, we've been on for a number of years now, 100% renewable energy. We've got zero to land for waste collection set up for now for a number of years now. Um, and we've we've reached ad net zero for, sorry, not ad net zero, we've reached net zero for our energy usage for the building and an overall reduction in the premises by 29%. So that's quite a big, uh, measurement that we were we were able to see and inspired us um and right now actually we're uh installing natural and mechanical ventilation which is a sort of lower carbon footprint than air conditioning so there's lots of things that we're doing and it's you know i guess it's just consistent and just making sure it's always at the forefront of like what we're discussing and on a weekly daily yearly basis that's great. And I think that demonstrates so many things that we sort of bang on about all the time. You know, you can't manage what you don't measure. If you know where you're starting from, you kind of know where you've got to get to or where you want to get to. And then you've got kind of a path to follow, at least, you know, if we want to get to here by this point, you can sort of look at the halfway and, you know, are we on track? I mean, that's kind of the beauty of having some data from that first year from our annual review that we've published so that, you know, we know where we're at. We know it's not quite the right picture yet but we know kind of what we need to do to kind of get that better picture and then we've got something to measure against so yeah it's really important it's really really fantastic to hear <clears throat> so that kind of leads me on to my next question given that everyone has the opportunity to download their own data and sort of compare it uh, perhaps i can come to you first stitch do you have a kind of plan for sort of how you might sort of go forward from here obviously you guys were a top user last year what's the sort of 
next step for you guys sort of i guess being an early adopter the, um i think the next step is uh, you know being very honest with ourselves and being like we're far from the finished product on it as yeah. well you know it's it's um i think Initially, I think we all had, which I think a lot of people do anyway, that little a bit of climate anxiety, whether we were doing enough or whether we were doing it well enough. So it's actually interesting here to hear about, you know, get the information in, don't try and perfect mm -hmm. it. I think um, I think we, we still need to do a lot more work on on training mm -hmm. internally, especially on, on the why side of things. It's really interesting if, um, what the guys basically said about the budget. Um, we, we do that as well. I've never once had a cost controller pushback on um on a line that's in there for for um to make a, a, a production more environmentally sustainable um so i think we, we need to sort of look into the costs mm -hmm. a little bit more as well um for offsetting and make sure pull that through and make for sure we cover ourselves financially because again to steve's point earlier it's you know we yeah. have to all still be around and, <clears throat> and making money mm -hmm. to be able to improve this stuff so so it's sustainable is important and it's at the forefront of everything that we're trying to do but it has to be sustainable both from a sort of green perspective and also from a business yeah. perspective so so i think there's there's quite a lot of work that we need to do there and in terms of um actually targets what we're trying to do and um, so we we set all of our carbon um for the entire year of 2022 and 2023 um, and we're trying to become climate positive, so pushing it over into a space where actually, you know, it's better to, it's better to exist that we don't, you know, to, to, to actually make an improvement on the, on the planet than just existing. Uh, in order to do that, some of the accreditation, we need to get much more accurate data. So I would say that's probably the next thing that we need to do. Not so much from the, the calculator, the calculator gives us great data, it's actually making sure the input's there. So, um, so yeah, they're the, they're the headlines of what we're trying to That's do. That's great. And yeah. I think, you know, offsetting is something that people do ask about. So if anyone is sort of unsure, um, once you start to put any activities in the tool for a project, you will get a, not only a carbon total, but a cost to offset, which is based on the cost of offsetting with our um, offset partner, which is Ecology. So that's essentially just the company we recommend, uh, which is the same as Albert. So if you do want to go down the offsetting route for things that are unavoidable, like say you had to bring someone from another country for some unavoidable reason, and you had to fly them, then that would be what you would do to kind of mitigate that. Obviously, that's the, the kind of worst case scenario. The offsetting should always be your kind of final option when you've done everything else you can. But if you do want to kind of take that last step, that is one you can take. And it is one that's sort of guided in the um, in the tool as well. So it's £10.50 per ton. So knowing that the average is 4.7 for a project or 12.8 if you're working on the larger sort of 50 grand plus per day you could allow that money in your budget. The whole point is that that gives you a total early on so that you can put that into your budget as a line if you want to, if you want to sort of do that offsetting piece at the end. So, so that's really interesting sort of, you know, that, that take on it. And I think you're right. It is about sort of, you know, saying that we are at this beginning point as we've kind of, you know, talked about, we've only had 89 companies or 87, uh, you know, complete projects this year. Whilst that's amazing, we know there are so many more out there. Obviously it's great to have you guys as super users to kind of help inspire others. But we know there's quite a way to go so it's really nice to kind of hear that you know honest experience so thank you stitch um and i think i'm just going to kind of finish up by i'd love to ask everyone if they had one tip and steve you can you can maybe kick this off sort of from an overall point um as an apa perspective if you had one tip for someone at a production company to sort of begin engaging with sustainable production methods what would it be uh, i think you get stuck in and learn uh, and take some of the learning people have done it here which is about starting to engage with it at the start of the production, not leaving it all till the end where it becomes like a bit of a pain in the ass task, like putting all your receipts together for the year or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just start earlier and try. And Little and often. Then we, then, we, then we can all learn from it. Maybe there are some changes to the system that we can learn, but it's, it's only by doing that we're going to learn. Absolutely. Yeah, that's totally true. And that's, any, that's the only way we will know what improvements we need to make as well on our side and what training you guys need. Um, perhaps Tom will come to you next. Um, well, yeah, actually, I was sort of echoing what Stitch was saying, really, in that we found it incredibly useful having one person sort of made uh, accountable, you know, with a lot of support. But but in terms of having one person and we can we actually sometimes revolve it, but someone who 
is sort of taking charge of the the the, the conversation and and also the sort of you know the, the to-do list and it, it allows for us then to sort of rather than in, in the past if everyone's accountable sometimes that can lead to a little bit of you know well I thought you were doing it or I thought you were doing it and actually what it does by just you know and they don't have to be you know they don't have to be doing it full time or they don't it's not necessarily their role you know when we're, we're not able to have a full time marshal or whatever I don't, I don't think that's something we'd, we would do right now but you know a lot of the production department are so invested in it you know they don't mind and they, they enjoy sort of taking responsibility for for a month and then it can swap or and that has been incredibly useful for us because it just allows it to be sort of keep keep on being driven forward really I guess. That's great. Um, Dahlia and Ollie? Um, my thing would just be uh, kind of almost echoing, but maybe a slightly different angle, is just um, like consistency uh, where possible mm -hmm. across across preferably every production that, that you do as a company. Um, stuff like, you know, Biscuit started doing meat free productions, office. It started off hard, it became a lot easier when people just accept that as part of life. Um, and I think that for almost every area of both um, trying to be more sustainable and also doing the, the dog work of inputting your data, you know, like send out a form to all of your crew asking what, what car they're using. It makes things so much easier for you to input input later on. I think just if everyone's consistent with with what you're doing, both to, to more easily record your data and also to create a more sustainable industry, then I think it will simply become the status quo. Um, maybe it's a bit airy fairy, but it would be nice. Also, <laughs> no, also that's great. Yeah, also realizing that the sustainable option might also be the more cost effective option, um, and you might end up just saving yourself a lot of money in the long run. Um, so mm -hmm. it's just thinking about it like that, and also just yeah. in terms of, you know, if you're, for example, when we have a shoot, we have um, the COVID health declaration forms, but we've kind of amended it because nowadays we're not testing, obviously, and. Uh, we've kind of amended it more so for ad green use and so our in-house ad green steward has added it on questions just things that can help them with their final report and this is something that we try to get all crew to, to fill out ahead of time um, and so these, this is something that I'm able to sort of see the numbers for catering how many people that will be on set and how many people we need to mm -hmm. account for so when I'm booking catering then I can know this is the amount of people that I need to account for maybe and a little bit of spare but I'm not going overboard to the point where we have so much waste. So things like that, it's mm -hmm. just, it allows you to sort of save money in the long run sometimes when you're thinking about sustainability. That's great. I love to hear about the kind of, you know, making it your policy. Like if you, you know, anyone who then has sort of the data, say for example, if they could see that their meat consumption was a massive part of the footprint over a period mm -hmm. of a year, it's then really easy to see that, okay, we can make this change. We can just say from next year, we just don't do meat based shoots. We just do veggie catering. And that cuts a massive amount out. That's really love. I love to hear that. Okay, cool. Um, and finally, Stitch. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, apart from the having having someone in house, if you can, like I understand it's a financial commitment as well. We double we our roles doubled up with another role in the business, um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, which still works, mm -hmm. uh, which might, might be more achievable for for others. Um, and then two other things. I think mm -hmm. transparency has been really big for us. Like we make sure that we pull a one-page report for for anyone we're working with at the end of the production. So whether they've asked us or engaged with Ag Green or not, um, you know, we have in our schedule to produce a little report for them. Um, and then the other thing, and that just keeps us to a timeline. I think with that, and just keeps us to to, to a commitment mm -hmm. to it to make sure that we keep it up. Um, and, and kind of helps with the why piece as well. It's like, look what we kind of can create because of, you know, your commitment and your support. Yeah, that's great. Well, and, that, and that was the last thing I was going to say, really, is just that the why piece when when engaging HODs, I think we found that um, mm -hmm. the best way yeah. to do it, would be like, okay, here's our, here's our minimum expectation and what we want to do, but what else can you do? Like, how, do you have any yeah. other ideas as to how we could reduce it? And we just found, like, when you're involving people in the conversation rather than dictating to them the, the certain way you want to do things, uh, we got really good mm -hmm. results from that and really engagement and everyone was really interested. That's great. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And you guys have been really inspiring and hopefully there's lots of people on this call who are thinking, okay, okay, maybe we could kind of get into this. So thank you so much for your insights and your thoughts. It's been really, really useful. So I'm just going to kind of wrap up 
I know we're a couple of minutes, or probably going to go a couple minutes over, so I hope you can stick around for a second. So um, I'm really kind of just excited to see what happens over the next, well, what we've got left now, sort of nine, eight months. Um, kind of what happens this year, we've already got more projects than we had this time last year. So we're really hoping we can kind of build that data set from last year and start to come up with some really good insights. Um, we're also releasing an additional CSV soon, additional download that you'll be able to get more kind of detailed about your data. So if you're a data person, you'll be excited by that. I hope certainly we are. Um, so we'll have a bit more insight in next year's annual review as to a bit more of the detail. Um, but we wanted to also remind you about um, downloading your own data. So there's going to be a, a link to a quick one minute video on how to do this coming up in the chat now. Um, for anyone who kind of does want to get started training, we just jump right in the training, sign up for the tool, just get started. We can help you, we can help point you to anything that you need. Um, and if we don't have it, we'll consider making it. If there's enough people want it, obviously it's needed. Um, our next module coming out is about um, using your budget to create a quick draft footprint. So keep an eye out for that. If you haven't, um, do sign up for our newsletter. So you get information about those things as well as they come available. Um, our next event is next Tuesday, which is the annual review for creative agencies. So please do share the link with any agencies that you work with or come along yourselves. Um, if you're interested in hearing sort of the agency perspective from our panel, um, and following that in May, we've got the annual review for brands. So please do also share that one with anyone who might be interested. The links for those are on our events page of our website. Thanks to everybody for, oh, and in the chat as well. Thanks, Toby. Thanks to everybody for joining today. Uh, it's great to see such an amazing turnout. And thanks also to the APA for helping publicise the event because that's really helped bring up the numbers as well. So that's fantastic.